Maccabees, that during the Maccabean revolt, Judas Maccabees walked around and he saw his dead soldiers with pagan amulets around their neck. And so he sent alms back to Jerusalem. And so Roman Catholics picked this up and said, see, there is an afterlife, an intermediate place where you can offer alms for the dead. And so they added what's called the Apocrypha to the canon in the 16th century. So they have some books in here that we don't have in uh, the Bibles that we use. In fact, uh, there's a number of them. There's Tobit, Judith, first book of Maccabees, second book of Maccabees, uh, several chapters, at least two in Daniel and part of a third one, that, uh, and Baruch are all added. That's, a, that's pretty uh, uh, arrogant uh, when you think that uh, you can add books to the Hebrew Scriptures which the Hebrew people themselves did not even recognize as part of their Scriptures. That's true. And these were books written during the intertestament period from the close of the Scriptures in 400 A.D. to the beginning of the New Testament. That's where you find these writings, the intertestament writings. And so you're right. The Jews never recognized it as canon. So how do you respond to a Catholic that says, you see, the Jews sent alms for the dead? Well, we don't do everything the Jews did <laughs> right. because they did some ungodly <laughs> things, even rejecting the Messiah. Yes. And so that is a very poor and weak excuse for Catholics to emulate the Jews in that regard. Let's talk a little bit about the attitude toward the Bible. You mentioned a few moments ago that in Vatican II, I believe it was, there was a change. That before that, really the official view, as I understand it, the Catholic Church was the Bible is too difficult to understand. The common person shouldn't read it. Let the church interpret it for you. But in Vatican II, there was a change saying, yes, you can read the Bible. Is that correct? That's correct. And yeah. there are actual Bible studies now going on in the Roman Catholic Church. But I happen to know also that there are a lot who still have the old attitude. For example, uh, I'm on the board of a ministry in Juarez, Mexico. When you drive into the city of Juarez, which is right across the border from El Paso, there is a huge mountain behind uh, Juarez. And up on that mountain, you can read it for 20 miles away, is a sign made of white rocks that was put up there by evangelical Christians. And it's in Spanish. And the sign says, the Bible is true. Read it. That's all the sign says. When that sign was put up there by evangelical Christians, when they purchased that piece of land, put it up there, the Catholic Bishop of Juarez went to the city council and demanded that they remove the sign. And the, every person on the council was a Catholic. And the mayor said, all it says is, the Bible is true. Read it. He said, I want it removed. The council refused to everybody's absolute astonishment. But here was a bishop of the church saying he didn't want to sign up that says the Bible is true, read it. You know why he wanted it removed? Why is that? John 8, 31 to 32. Jesus said, if you're a disciple of mine, you will abide in my word. Then you will know the truth and, and the, the truth, truth will set, you, set free. you free. He didn't want the Catholics being set free from the bondage of deception, from the bondage of legalism. So even though Vatican II changed it, there's still some of that old lingering attitude about the Bible being a little bit dangerous for the common person to handle. Yes, but you have to understand the Catholic Church still teaches that the only authoritative interpreters of the Word of God are the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. You and I don't have the privilege of interpreting the Word of God on our own. We must go through the magisterium of the Catholic Church. And it's interesting, isn't it, Dave, when you read the epistles, they weren't written to the magisterium or to a collection of bishops. They were written to the saints. That's right. Each one of us is responsible for what the Word of well, God says. Well, it's said. amazing the power of the Word of God. I can understand why they would be afraid of it because uh, I, I remember one time I was in southern Indiana and uh, holding a meeting, a very small church there in Pekin, Indiana. And I went the first night and the whole front row, there were about eight people sitting on the front row, and they all had two or three Bibles, and they all had pencils. And they, I mean, they were the most enthusiastic people I ever saw in my life. They took notes all through. They kept looking in their Bibles, and everybody else just sitting there, you know. So when it was over, I went and I said, Who are you people? And they said, Well, we're a, a Catholic Bible study group from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And we've been listening to you on the radio, and we decided to come up here and, and, and said, we, we, we just, We're just loving the Word of God. We're just really. About the third night they came up to me and they said, you know, we have been studying the book of Acts for the last uh, year. And we noticed in the book of Acts that every time a person believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they would baptize them. They said, would you baptize us in water? 
And I said, I'd be delighted to. The next night I baptized eight Catholics. They had never even seen a full immersion baptism in their lives. And they all got ready. And when we motioned for them to come down, I turned to the audience and all of a sudden the water started coming up almost over the top. And I looked and all eight were getting in at the same <laughs> time. I said, no, we do this one at a time. I, I dipped the first one and he came up and he threw water out to about the fifth row yelling, <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Scared everybody there to death. They couldn't imagine anybody being so excited about being baptized. But that praise shows you God. the power of the Word. They just wanted to do what people were doing in New Testament times. Well, Dave, you bring up a good point. The book of Acts, oftentimes I challenge Roman Catholics because they believe that their church was founded by <laughs> Jesus and it's the same today that it was 2,000 years yeah. ago. So I say, read the book of Acts. It's a history book of the first century church. See if you find a priest offering a sacrifice for sins. See if you find priests forbidden to marry. See if you find infallible popes. You know, and they, you get them into the Bible, you challenge them, and they're going to read the book of Acts, and they won't find anything like that. They won't find scapulars and rosaries and <laughs> holy water. But you know what they're going to find? They're going to find the gospel going forth. And if they can be challenged by their faith and recognize it's not the same church that Jesus founded, then Hopefully they'll continue to read the scriptures and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Back a few moments ago in uh, response to one of my questions, you made an offhand comment that I'd like to come back to. You, you said that uh, the Catholic Church in its catechism now recognizes that uh, there are more than one more than one way to heaven. That, for example, Muslims can be saved following the Muslim religion. But you, if I think I heard you right, you said that Protestants are still condemned. Where, what is the Catholic view toward Protestantism? Well, from the Council of Trent and Vatican Council II, they have issued anathemas against Protestants that believe that, for example, you're justified by faith alone. Uh, that's one of over 100 anathemas. Vatican Council II, which convened in 1962 to 65, it issued one anathema. It dared to say that if you don't believe the Catholic Church has the power to grant indulgences, which is a remission of temporal punishment for sin, or that they're not efficacious in doing so, then you are anathema. I thought that was supposed to be the great liberal conference that, that opened up the Catholic Church and really changed it and opened it up even to Protestants. To ecumenical movements, yes, but they still issued that one anathema, <laughs> elevating the dogma of, of uh, indulgences once so again. So they would consider you and me as lost as a goose, huh? Well, it's interesting because throughout my travels around the world, I often go out and engage Roman Catholic priests. I'll go knock on their door in the rectory and they're always welcoming me because the great movement within Rome now is to bring all separated brethren back home to Rome. That's our term for us, separated brethren? Yes. Prior to Vatican II we used to be called heretics. Okay. But it's, tar it's, it's <laughs> difficult to woo anybody back home when you call them a heretic, so now we're called separated brethren. All right. But the Roman Catholic priest uh, will, will tell me, he'll exhort me, Mike, come back for the fullness of salvation. And my response to the priest is that in Christ, I already have the complete forgiveness of sins, and you don't. By your own teachings, you don't. In Christ, I have a permanent right standing before God, and you don't, according to your teachings. In Christ, I have the assurance of eternal life based on His promises and His power, and you don't have that assurance. So why don't you leave your religion and come to Jesus? Then you too can enjoy every spiritual blessing in Him. But when he says, I don't have the fullness of salvation, you know what he's referring to? I don't have the Eucharist. Oh. And until I come home to Rome, I can't have the Eucharist. Yes. To a Catholic, that is the ultimate. That is the central part of their worship. And that is what they consume mm. in order to receive Jesus every week. Now, you said you were going to tell me a story about something here. Well, it's interesting. We were invited to a rally that the Roman Catholic Church had in Plano, Texas just a few years ago. They rented the Plano Center. 1,500 Roman Catholics paid $65 a piece to come and learn how they could evangelize Protestants and how they could defend themselves against the Protestant church. And you went? Well, we were invited <laughs> under the condition that we would not try to oh. evangelize. 
And so they, they watched us with eagle eyes as we walked around and listened to the different speakers. But it's fascinating how the Catholic Church has changed since I left because the priest is no longer in the position of the teaching authority, but now they have these former Protestant pastors. Former have, Protestant pastors. They've apostatized. 